Kinematics discusses acceleration as a change of velocity. The question, what causes the acceleration, is not asked. This is the topic of dynamics. The physics discipline of dynamics describes how acceleration is the consequence of an unbalanced force. The picture illustrates this. A net force is acting on the inertial mass. The sledge will be accelerated in the forward direction. One may pinpoint the discovery of the nature of force as a cause of acceleration, A equals dvdt, to Newton's Eureka moment in 1666, which most likely occurred in this garden, shown here on this photo in its contemporary state, in this garden and Woolthorpe Manor in England. The photo even includes an apple tree. The dropping apple, as observed by Newton, being accelerated towards the center of Earth, led Newton to say, I quote, there must be drawing power in matter. Apart from discovering gravitation as an attraction between masses, in this moment Newton also linked for the first time acceleration to drawing power, which we now understand as force. Triggered by his observation, Newton then collected his experiences as far as force is concerned, and we share those experiences. We can say that an unbalanced force accelerates an inertial mass. We observe further that this inertial mass can be that of any object. Any object that has a mass is well represented by a point mass at its center. We can imagine, for example, that the entire mass of the apple is concentrated at its center, at its center of mass, which we represent by a point mass, as illustrated here. We know further from experience that the larger the inertial mass m, the more force is required for the same amount of acceleration. F is proportional, the force is proportional to the amount of inertial mass. The description of mass in this context as inertial mass is deliberate in order to distinguish this aspect of mass, namely the fact that it resists external forces, being inert, from its other important property, namely that it can attract other masses gravitationally. It may be ascribed to the genius of Newton that he was able to comprise these experiences of force that we all share in one distinct law of nature, the second postulated law of mechanics. Let us appreciate Newton's achievements by following him on a walk around his birthplace and home and the place of his greatest discoveries. It was in fact a coincidence of history that in 1666 Newton ended up back in the summer at his home at the village of Woolthorpe's because England was affected by a plague academic that had also spread to Cambridge, Newton's university. It may have been the relative tranquility of this place that brought about this flurry of ideas that changed the world forever. In one dimension one can quote Newton's second law like this. An unbalanced force F is equal to the product of an inertial mass m and its acceleration caused by this force a. This is also equal to the product of mass m times the second time differentiation of the position of that mass x, written in Newton's original notation as m times x dot dot. The first law, the inertia principle, already states what happens to an inertial mass when forces are absent or when they are balanced. It says, in the absence of a force, an inertial mass is at rest or it undergoes uniform motion without acceleration. The product of inertial mass and velocity is defined as momentum with the dimension mass times length on time. P, the momentum, is equal to m times v, mass times velocity. Since, as we know from kinematics, Acceleration A is equal to the first time differentiation of velocity and the mass M is constant. One can also write the second law as F is equal to M times D on DT of V, 
which is the same as writing that f is equal to the first time differentiation of momentum. The force acting on an inertial mass is thus equal to the change of momentum with time. Like the quantities acceleration, velocity and position, force has directional qualities. Therefore, it is best represented by a vector. This is illustrated in the sketches. An inert mass m, moving already with a velocity v to the right in the x direction, experiences a force f. This force accelerates the mass m. It will move faster and faster. Underneath, the opposite situation is shown. The inert mass m moves to the right with a velocity v and a force f acts onto it into the negative x direction. This negative force decelerates the mass, or one can say it accelerates in the opposite direction. This will reduce the velocity v of the inert mass so that it eventually will come to a rest before it is then accelerated into the negative x direction. Since force is a vector, the principle of linear superposition applies to several forces that act on the mass. These forces, shown here are 2, F1 and F2, combine to a net force. The net force is always calculated as the vector sum of the contributing forces. This principle of linear superposition that is implicit in the second law, because the second law deals with vectors, force F and acceleration A, is sometimes referred to as Newton's fourth law, because it is a very important aspect of mechanics. It is clear that, as with the other vector quantities in mechanics, the concept of force and the second law can be generalized to three dimensions. That's shown here. m times a vector is equal to m times the second time differentiation of the position vector. That can be expressed in different ways, as shown here, and maybe more succinctly using Newton's dot dot notation as m times x dot dot, y dot dot, and z dot dot. Since both velocity and force are vectors, the relative orientation of these two vectors, as they apply to a certain inert mass m, matters. For example, force and velocity vector can be parallel. They can be perpendicular, or they can have an angle in between parallel and perpendicular. These three situations are illustrated here. If the two vectors are parallel, the force accelerates the mass in the same direction in that it is already moving, and the magnitude of the velocity, the speed, will increase. The direction of motion remains unchanged. This is different when the force acts in the direction that is perpendicular on the direction of motion of the mass. In this case, the acceleration is perpendicular and it causes a deflection of the trajectory. The trajectory becomes curved. The speed, the magnitude of velocity, is unchanged. The third possibility, with the force direction being at an angle between 0 and 90 degrees, has both consequences. The perpendicular component of the force causes a deflection of the trajectory, whereas the parallel component of the force, parallel with respect to the velocity vector, increases the speed the magnitude of the velocity vector. So in this case the mass will be deflected and it also moves faster and faster. Let us look at a few examples of forces in action. A bobsleigh may slide down a ramp without friction or drag. This motion is accelerated by the gravitational force, the gravitational attraction of Earth, the pull of Earth, the weight force which acts vertically downward and it is given by the product of the mass of the bobsleigh times the acceleration due to gravity. The weight force Fg, which points vertically downward, can be split into two components in line with the principle of linear superposition. The components are a component of force that is parallel to the ramp and a component that is perpendicular to the ramp. The angle theta of the ramp shows up in this force di diagram as the angle between the perpendicular force component and Fg. Using trigonometry, one can therefore say that the parallel component of the force is given by Fg times the sine of the ramp angle theta and the 
perpendicular component equals fg times the cosine of theta. Since the perpendicular component is compensated by the normal force of the ramp supporting the bobsleigh, the net force acting on the bobsleigh and accelerating it is given by the parallel component f parallel. This interpretation is detailed further on this slide. The perpendicular force component is balanced by the strength of the materials of the ramp. So fs, the normal force of the ramp, equals minus f perpendicular. There is thus no net force in this direction and the bobsleigh does indeed not move in the perpendicular direction. In contrast, the parallel force component is not balanced by any other force. It thus causes an acceleration of the bobsleigh in the parallel direction down the ramp. Applying Newton's second law, we can write that the weight force Fg times sine theta is equal to mg times sine theta and the cause of an acceleration. It is an unbalanced force due to the gravitational pull of Earth. The consequence of this unbalanced force is the acceleration of an inertial mass m, so that on the other side of the equation we have the product of inertial mass m times acceleration a. The acceleration of the bobsleigh of mass m down the ramp is thus given by a equal to g times sine theta. Since g and theta are both constant, the acceleration a is also constant. We therefore have a uniformly accelerated motion and we know from kinematics that the position equation for such a motion is given by x of t is equal to one half the acceleration which in this case is g times sine theta times time squared plus v naught times t initial velocity times t plus the initial position x naught. Both of these terms are zero because we are starting from rest at the position x equals zero. We conclude therefore that by working out the net force of a problem and applying Newton's second law, we can decide what the acceleration is of a particular inertial mass. Once we know acceleration as a function of time, we can use kinematics to determine the equations of motion. A different situation arises if the two riders of the bobsleigh push the bob on horizontal ice with friction and drag neglected. The force diagram for this situation is at the bottom left. The weight force mg is compensated by the antiparallel normal force of the ice. However, the push of the riders in the horizontal direction results in the force f push. F push is unbalanced and as expected from Newton's second law, it causes an acceleration in the horizontal direction, in the x direction. We can therefore write f push vector is equal to inertial mass m times acceleration vector and that can be expressed in this case as the mass times the vector written in components with an ax component and zeros in the y and z components. Again the push force is the cause and the acceleration in the x direction is the consequence of that force acting on the inertial mass. Observing the dropping apple, attracted gravitationally by the mass of Earth, triggers another question, namely about the symmetry of the force concept. If Earth, the mass of Earth, gravitationally attracts the apple, the mass of the apple also should attract Earth. The two forces have to be symmetric. And indeed, that is the statement of Newton's third postulated law. Mathematically we say the force of the apple on earth is equal to minus the force of the earth on the apple. Note that these two forces act on different objects. That's a very important aspect of this third law. This symmetry applies to all forces and it goes well beyond mechanics. Take for example the electrostatic repulsion of two electrons. Electron 1, shown here on the bottom left, is repelled by electron 2 and vice versa electron 2 is repelled by electron 1. Again the two forces are symmetric, antiparallel and they act on two different objects. The same symmetry also applies to the nuclear force which is attractive over short distances. That's illustrated on the bottom right. A proton attracts a neutron 
and the force of the neutron on the proton FNP is equal to minus the force of the proton onto the neutron. The force concept is symmetric. For every action force there is a reaction force which is equal in magnitude and it points into the other direction. And also very importantly the two forces act on different objects. Let us translate this symmetry of force back into a typical mechanics situation. A person pushes a cart on rails. The two objects, person and cart, are represented by their centers of mass as point masses. And the force of the person on the cart acts on the center of mass of the cart. The reaction force to this action is the force by the cart on the person that acts on the center of mass of the person, to the left. We note that as expected, the forces act on different objects and they point in different directions while having the same magnitude. The question arises now, why does the cart move? Are these two forces not balanced and the net force is zero? This interpretation is wrong. As we just correctly interpreted, the two forces form a third law, action equals reaction pair. And they don't act on the same object, so they can't balance each other. But why does the cart move to the right and not the person to the left, for example? Before looking at this with some more detail, it's instructive to visualize the situation of being on ice, maybe on ice skates, and um, trying to push a friend also on ice skates. Does that actually work? Experience tells us that you can't push if you're on slippery ground. But the situation here is different. The cart is on rails, so it doesn't experience any friction. The cart is on slippery ground. The person, on the other hand, is on rough ground, and there will be a friction force that stabilizes the person. If we include the friction force in our consideration, we can understand why the cart moves to the right and the person stays where it is. The friction between the rough ground and the shoes of the person is translated through the strength and stability of the body to the person's center of mass. There it counteracts the force by the card on the person. The net force on the center of mass of the person is zero. In contrast, there is no balancing force acting on the center of mass of the card because it stands on slippery ground on the rails. Therefore, there is a net force pointing to the right and the car will accelerate towards the right. We have just introduced a friction force acting on the feet of the person. In line with Newton's third postulated law, this force also should have a reaction force. What is that reaction force? Well, it is the force by the two feet onto the ground. So, in fact, there are in this case two forces. Force foot one on ground and in addition force for two on ground and the sum the vectorial sum of those two forces is the reaction force associated with the friction force and this sum points in the opposite direction than the friction force it points to the left again we notice that this action reaction pair acts on different objects the friction force acts on the feet and the symmetric reaction force to this acts on the ground the fact that force comes in symmetric pairs is expressed by the third law, which might be put like this. Every force has a symmetric, antiparallel partner force that is associated with it. The partner force has the same magnitude as the first force, but it acts on the object that causes the first force. Traditionally, and somewhat misleading, this third law is phrased as an action always has an anti-equal reaction. In Latin, actio equals reactio. This might confuse because it gives the impression that first there is an action force which is then followed like a kind of a consequence by a reaction force. In fact, the two forces form a symmetric pair. Mathematically, an action-reaction pair can be unambiguously be expressed as F12 equals minus F21, where F12 vector is the force acting on object 2 and F vector 21 is the reaction force acting on ob object 1. This concise representation contains all the important aspects of the third law. 
the minus sign tells us that the forces point in different direction and the swap of the indices 1 and 2 to 2 and 1 indicates to us that the two forces act on two different objects. Newton's three postulated laws form a correct and complete foundation of mechanics. In brief, one may say that the first law tells us that if there is no force, then an inertial mass m moves with a constant velocity or it is at rest. The second law tells us if there is a net force, then that force will accelerate an inertial mass. And finally, the third law points out the symmetry of the force concept. A force by 1 on 2 is equal to the negative force by 2 on 1. Two masses interacting with another experience anti-equal forces. Having formulated this foundation of mechanics through these three laws, one may ask what consequences they entail. An important consequence of the second law is that in the absence of a net force, where the sum of all external forces equals zero, an inertial mass is not accelerated. Therefore, the first law applies and the mass is then postulated to be at rest, or it may move with a constant velocity. Having the inertial mass at rest is in fact a very important situation in engineering, which we often refer to as a static equilibrium. It is therefore important to understand how Newton's laws relate to this situation of static equilibrium. The link between the first postulate and static equilibrium is the concept of the inertial frame of reference. If the net force on an inertial mass is zero, finding the correct inertial frame of reference allows us to place this mass at rest. In that situation, the forces are equilibrated, therefore equilibrium, and the mass is at rest, therefore static, static equilibrium. So what are inertial frames of reference? They may be defined as being rectilinear, three axes with right angles between them, in a right-hand sense, such as a Cartesian coordinate system. As shown at the top left, two different inertial frames of reference have different coordinates, x, y and z for the same point. However, they all have the same time. Time does not change between inertial frames of reference. Two such frames relate to each other via a so-called Galilei transformation, in that these two frames move with respect to each other at a constant velocity v constant in direction and in magnitude. Importantly, inertial frames of reference are never accelerated. They always move at a constant speed. In the example shown at the top left, the red frame of reference moves with respect to the black frame of reference in the x direction at a constant speed v. Therefore, at a time t, the distance between the two origins is equal to v times t. It is crucial to realize that an inertial frame of reference does not simply refer to three coordinate axes, three reference axes that move through space. What's meant here is that space itself moves with respect to a different space. A good example of this is a railway car, as shown here. The car itself moves through a space that is defined by the frame number one. A second space, defined by frame number 2, exists on top of the car. It moves along at a constant speed v as the railway car moves to the right. Consequently, frame 2 moves with respect to frame 1 at a constant velocity v. If we now consider a box on top of the railway car with a mass m, there are only two forces acting here. The weight of the box, minus mg, and the normal force by the car supporting the box, both attacking at the center of mass of the box. It is apparent that independent of frame 1 or frame 2, in both cases, these two forces are balanced. They compensate each other. The difference between frame 1 and frame 2 is, however, that in frame 1, the box is not static. It moves at a constant speed v whereas in frame 2, the box is at rest. 
what we see in this example is true in general. Whenever there is no net force and the first law, the inertia principle, applies, we can always find a reference frame in which the inertial mass is static, is at rest. Using the concept of inertial frame of reference, the first Newton law can therefore be phrased like this. If there is no force on a mass, there always exists an inertial frame of reference in which that mass is at rest. Why is this concept of inertial frame so important? On first sight it may appear that defining this somewhat obscure concept of an inertial frame of reference may be just complicating mechanics, may just be a detail. However, this is not true for three reasons. The first of those three is that without any amendments, Newton's laws are only valid in such inertial frames of reference. Indeed, there are important exceptions, reference frames that are non-inertial frames of reference. They are typically accelerated. Examples are an accelerating elevator, going up or going down, a carousel with an inward acceleration by the centripetal force, and thirdly, our rotating planet Earth itself. Finally, the concept of inertial frame of reference prepares special relativity in order to explain that there is an upper limit for speed given by the speed of light in vacuum and that this speed of light is independent of reference frame, Einstein relaxed the universal time t that classical mechanics assumes for all inertial systems and replaced also the Galilei transformation by the Lorentz transformation to arrive at his theory of special relativity. If an elevator is at rest, it is an inertial frame of reference and Newton's laws apply unamended. If it starts moving up, being accelerated upward, the elevator is not an inertial reference system anymore and Newton's laws have to be amended by a pseudo-force, which in this case has the magnitude mg and points downward. So we perceive the real effect of this pseudo-force that our weight appears to have doubled. On the way down, the elevator may accelerate with minus g. In this case, our perception is that we are briefly weightless. This is because the pseudo-force mg now compensates the actual weight mg. It is apparent that although those fictitious forces that correct for the acceleration of the frame of reference are called pseudo-forces, they nevertheless can have real effects. A similar situation arises on a carousel, only that in this case the acceleration is inward. Every point, including the observer on a roundabout like this, moves with an angular velocity. That means every point undergoes an inward acceleration and as a consequence, because this is therefore not an inertial reference system anymore, experiences a fictitious outward force. This force, this fictitious pseudo-force is called the centrifugal force that has the magnitude mass times omega squared times radius. In this case, omega is the angular velocity and r is the distance from the center of rotation, the radius. Since Earth is a three-dimensional carousel, on Earth we also experience fictitious pseudo-forces. We experience the centrifugal force, as shown in the cartoon on the left, which is particularly strong at the equator because the radius is large. And if we move, such as the ski jumper, we can experience a Coriolis force. In the case illustrated, the jump goes from north to south and the rotation is to the right, therefore the uh, Coriolis pseudo force acts to the left. Apart from taking ski jumpers off their path, the fictitious Coriolis force is also responsible for cyclones and tornadoes, as illustrated by the photo. It also affects the trajectory of missiles, as shown at the bottom right. If a cannon is fired from the equator to the north, then the actual trajectory is deflected to the right. If instead the cannon fires to the south, the uh, direction is deflected to the left of the direction of motion of the projectile. The magnitude of the deflection due to the Coriolis force is given by mass times 
rotational frequency omega times the velocity of the projectile. This simulation shows the effects of the Coriolis force on a point mass moving on a carousel. The top part shows the situation as observed from the outside, from above, from within an inertial frame of reference. At the bottom the situation is shown for an observer that rotates with the carousel, within a non-inertial reference frame. Coming back to inertial frames of reference, frames that do not experience any acceleration and therefore do not feature pseudo-forces, we find that a mass can be in static equilibrium. This fact that in an inertial frame a point mass m that is at rest does not experience a net force, as stated by the first law by Newton, is crucial for the design of engineering structures such as bridges or towers, because this can be taken advantage of through the condition of static equilibrium. Since all forces that are present in this case add up to zero, in line with vector algebra, we can write down the net force F is equal to zero and it's given by the sum of all contributing forces F1, F2, F3 and so on. If now some of these forces are known, others can be calculated taking advantage of the condition of this condition of static equilibrium. At the bottom a typical example is shown. In this case the weight mg of the mass m and the tension force Ft1 may be known. Using the diagram and trigonometry one can then work out the magnitude and direction of Ft2, the second tension force pulling along a rope to the right. Since the mass m is at rest, it is static, using a force diagram, also often referred to as a free body diagram, Ft2 is determined using the condition of static equilibrium. In an inertial frame of reference, Newton's laws apply to all types of forces. However, some important forces with certain characteristics may be distinguished. One of them is the centripetal force that forces a point mass onto a circular trajectory, as illustrated here. The left shows this situation. A ball moves on a circle and the centripetal force assures that it remains on this circle. It is provided in this case by a string. Therefore, the reaction force to the centripetal force is the tension in the string. The centripetal force acts inward, is directed inward, and it has the magnitude mass times velocity squared, that's the linear velocity of the ball on the circle, tangential to the circle, divided by the distance to the center of the circle, the radius, divided by r. The cartoon on the right shows what happens when the string rips. Suddenly there is no force acting more on the ball and it continues in straight linear motion at constant speed in a straight tangential direction in line with Newton's first law. This demonstration shows the effects of the centripetal force. A string forces a mass on a circular path. The centripetal force is thus provided by the tension in the string. When the string snaps the mass flies off tangentially, in agreement with the inertia principle, on a straight line and at constant speed. The equation for the centripetal force, mv squared on r, is derived using trigonometry and calculus. If we look at the cartoon at the top left, we see that velocities are shown in red and the radius is shown in black. We identify two triangles a triangle formed by the two velocity vectors and the change in velocity in red and uh, a triangle that is formed by the two radius vectors and the distance traveled shown in blue here. The two triangles are similar therefore the change in velocity on velocity has to be the same as the distance traveled on radius. Since kinematics tells us that distance traveled is equal to velocity times time, we can modify this equation and write change in velocity on velocity equals velocity times time on radius. Now, multiplying both sides by velocity and divide both sides by time, we obtain change in velocity on time 
is equal to velocity squared on radius. Since acceleration is the change of velocity with time, and um, Newton's second postulate tells us that force is mass times acceleration, we can modify further and see that acceleration is given by velocity squared on radius. And also centripetal force is equal to mass times velocity squared on radius. In this last step we have also applied calculus in that we have made the changes in radius and velocity infinitesimally small. And we obtain F centripetal is equal to mv squared on r. The centripetal force does not change the speed of the mass m, but its direction, perpendicularly to the direction of motion, forces that mass onto a circular path. Another important force is the friction force. A friction force results from the microscopic interaction of two adjacent surfaces. In principle one can distinguish static friction, that means the two surfaces do not move with respect to each other, and kinetic friction. In that case, they do move with respect to each other. A large normal force presses these two rough surfaces closer together than is the case when that normal force is not so large. Therefore, large normal forces correspond to a lot of friction and small normal forces correspond to very little friction. This assumes that the surface properties, the material properties, are unchanged. Those material properties are characterized by the coefficients of friction, mu s for static friction and mu kf for kinetic friction. They are defined as the ratio of the magnitude of the friction force on the normal force. Generally, the static coefficient of friction is larger than the coefficient for kinetic friction. This agrees with our experience. It's generally harder to get an object moving and then when it moves, it keeps moving, although it still experiences friction. The free body force diagram at the top left shows a typical situation of static friction. The box, in this case, sits on a rough surface and it does not move because all forces are balanced and the, the net force is zero. On this plane inclined at an angle theta, the weight force Fg can be split into two components an Fy component perpendicular to the plane and a Fx component that is parallel to the plane. The normal force due to the strength of the plane compensates the Fy component. If the plane was frictionless, the Fx component parallel to the plane would make the box move. However, in this case, it is fully compensated by the static friction force Ff. The static friction force FF is also parallel to the plane, but it points upward, against the possible direction of motion. This is how the static coefficient of friction can be measured. In this case, an aluminium block sits on a plane that is gradually inclined. The component of the weight force that is parallel to the inclined plane tries to pull the block downward. However, this force is opposed by the friction force that points in the opposite direction. Eventually, the inclination angle is large enough so that the downward pointing component of the weight force exceeds the force due to static friction. Just before this angle is reached, the two forces are balanced and from the geometry the coefficient of static friction can be calculated, as shown before. Drag forces due to air resistance are very similar to friction forces. As with friction, the effects are microscopic and they can be quite complex and complicated. In detail they are discussed in fluid dynamics and um, in the case of the parachute one might for example distinguish a pressure drag and turbulence. Within mechanics the resistive forces due to drag can often be approximated using one of these two equations. In the case of a very viscous medium and low velocity one might think of a spoon sinking into honey F drag might be approximated as minus constant V1 times velocity. So it's proportional to the velocity of motion, however opposed to it pointing in the other direction. If the medium is not so viscous and the velocities are large, one might think of a plane traveling through air or a car traveling through air. 
then it may be more appropriate to approximate the drag forces using the second equation, which is given by minus B2 V squared. So in this case, the force increases proportionally to the velocity squared, and again opposing the motion. Drag forces change with velocity. A force that changes with position is the spring force. That is given by Hooke's law. F spring is equal to minus k, the spring constant, times position x. Since this law is linear with respect to position, it takes twice as much force to stretch a spring twice as far. Similarly, it takes twice as much force to compress a spring twice as far. As indicated by the minus sign, the spring opposes its compression or its stretch. It may be springs pushing or weight forces pulling. According to Newton's second law, unbalanced forces are the cause of acceleration. The acceleration of an inertial mass is the consequence of a force. It has become apparent that within mechanics, dynamics discusses the forces and their characteristics as they cause an acceleration of an inertial mass in line with Newton's postulated second law. And those forces that are in equilibrium with a net force of zero acting on a mass that is therefore at rest in an inertial frame of reference in agreement with Newton's first law. It has also become clear that every force has a symmetric anti-parallel partner force that acts on a different object as it is stated by Newton's third law. There are more interesting aspects of forces that are discussed within the context of work and energy and this is because some forces are so-called conservative which means that their effects on a point mass m can be reversed. A discussion of dynamics is therefore typically followed by a discussion of work, energy and energy conservation.